Hi, I'm Kevin Rip of Aquafix. They call me the Bug Man, but more formally, I'm the Director of um, Science and Innovation here at Aquafix. Thank you for joining us today. Today's topic is digesting feedstocks for improved biogas production. My role at the company is managing the laboratory, managing our experiments, and making sure we're working on the behalf of our customers. Hello, I'm Dan. I'm a senior researcher for wastewater over at Aquafix Laboratories. I do a lot of collaborating and client consultation work, and I've been working hard the last year to develop the anaerobic testing services so Aquafix can do a lot more internal research and development for products, that kind of thing. I'll talk a bit more about it later. But. I'm Chris. I'm a technical representative here at Aquafix. I work with uh, anaerobic digester customers in our lab to help not only discover what challenges they face, but also help them maximize their gas produce and uh, improve their process overall. I'll be going over some of the products that uh, Aquafix has for anaerobic digestion specifically at the end and interjecting with these guys as we go throughout the presentation. This is a picture of our lab at the University of Wisconsin Research Park. We have a laboratory that is just dedicated to anaerobic work, anaerobic processes of all types, lagoons, above ground, uh, UASBs, and all we do is study them on the behalf of our customers. We like to say our lab is your lab. Some of the things we work on understanding are things like foaming, grease and long chain fatty acid degradation, degradation of proteins and cellulosic materials, reducing H2S formation. And we do all of this while trying to improve customers' methane production. All right, so here's just a list of the materials provided throughout the presentation. You can access these in the Handouts tab at the top right of your screen at any time you want. A couple other quick comments before I get started. There may be a couple polls that pop up throughout the presentation, so definitely keep your eyes open for those. We'd like to see some of your responses so we can get a better sense of who our audience is exactly but with respect to what digesters you have and that kind of thing. Um, in addition, feel free to chat amongst yourselves the entire time. It's always nice when there's a bit of a discussion going on in the chat related to the topic. So definitely feel free to use that. We'll be taking your questions as they come up throughout the presentation if they're relevant to what we're talking about at a given moment. Otherwise, we're going to have an extended question and answers at the end of this presentation. All right, so my part of this presentation today, uh, I'm going to lead off just doing a little bit of an anaerobic overview for everybody. So, get a little basics out of the way. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about challenges associated with feedstocks and considerations surrounding feedstock, particularly with should you accept a feedstock or not, what sort of feedstocks might be well blended together, that kind of thing. Anyway, after I'm done talking, Chris will start to cover more of our products specifically and go through the products we discussed on the previous slide with the product or uh, the handouts. All right, so here's just a quick digester diagram. Not going to spend too much time on this. This is a complete mixed digester. Uh, we work with a number of different kinds, but the complete mixed digester is kind of the most standard. Got a lot of these at municipal systems, that kind of thing. They're good at handling high solids. But the main thing to consider with anaerobic digesters is while the tank, like in the previous slide, that the bacteria are inside of or archaea is important, really what matters is you have a healthy bacterial population inside your digester, so it can perform certain roles in the anaerobic digestion process. Anaerobic digestion takes place in these steps we have listed on the left. Uh, initially, mixing or agitation is going to break down large lumps of solids into small chunks of solids, which at that point, bacteria will begin to work on them through the hydrolysis process. So bacteria uh, can produce some things called exoenzymes, which are excreted outside the bacterial cell, and they begin to convert these particulate matters and colloidal compounds that are not soluble in solution into soluble compounds that they can move inside cells and begin to degrade fully. Um, following that, you have acetogenesis, which is a fermentative step where you're producing short-chain fatty acids from long-chain fatty acids followed by acetogenesis, which is the production of acetic acid or acetate, which is one of the main things that your methanogens are going to be using to produce methane. So you have a multi-step process. There's numerous different communities of bacteria working together, and they're all quite important. Um, the main challenges we've seen in practice, however, come down to slow hydrolysis or slow methanogenesis. Now, an organism you don't want to see in your digester is this picture on the slide here, which we did a bunch of work with anaerobic uh, filaments. 
where we were trying to identify filamentous organisms in anaerobic digesters because the different environment is toxic to most aerobic filaments. So they begin to change shape and form, but here's a photo of anaerobic microfrix barbicella. While microfrix will not grow into a digester, it often goes into a digester through waste activated sludge and it can take like a month to fully degrade. So it's a real pain. I just want to add before we get into this, I always like to talk to customers that the methanogens are often the limiting factor. They're very slow growing and it's important that the acid formers don't overpower the methanogens. So in a community, we're always looking at a balance, a balance between all the organisms, make sure we don't feed them too hard or too heavy to overpower the methanogens. Yeah, yeah, in fact, just a quick comment regarding that. When you talk about your acetogenic and acetogenic communities, you're talking about thousands of different varieties of organisms, which are all gonna be present, and they can all kind of take over if there's a shortcoming in the digestion process. So you can, they can make do with a wide variety of conditions. But with methanogens, we're talking like six to eight, you know, different types of organisms. It's much more limited. They reproduce substantially more slowly than the aerobic organisms. So it's just, they're not able to adapt to change. Yeah, there's really no diversity in methanogens. The other organisms have a lot of diversity, but the methanogens, you're talking about a very small community. All right, so just going through a couple types of digesters we work with, there's a lot of subcategories and things that don't fit neatly into these three categories, but I think it covers everything pretty well. Uh, first, we have our lagoons. We see these lots of times in industries. They're relatively inexpensive to construct. There are some challenges with lagoons associated with collecting methane, but we have a lot of lagoons with synthetic covers that are able to collect and use their biogas as well. In fact, in some cases, they produce quite a lot of biogas. It's really impressive. Uh, we have a couple sites where they're actually producing more biogas than they want, and they aren't able to use it all, so they don't know what to do with it. Uh, but generally speaking, lagoons are good at lowering COD and substrate coming in, but they're not going to have as complete a degradation as the other processes. And they are susceptible to filling up with sludge and channeling, which over time can require the removal of sludge because you can end up losing a lot of treatment time if it's been, you know, eight to 10 years since the last time you've removed sludge from your lagoon. So keep that in mind with those processes. Um, the next thing is kind of my standard system. I like to talk about the complete mixed digester. Some of these are really well mixed. Some of them are not as well mixed. Um, there's also, there's a lot of considerations with mixing. Like if you overmix, sometimes you're more likely to get foaming. If you undermix, you can have little pockets of substrate that are not getting degraded well. It's always a bit of a balancing act, but uh, they tend to function fairly reliably and complete mixed digesters are pretty decent at degrading uh, high solids waste substrates like waste activated sludge, primary sludge, things like that. Uh, finally, we have another category, which I'm lumping into UASVs. There's a number of variants on here where you start to get to have very high rate digesters designed to remove, you know, 30,000 to 60,000 parts per million COD coming in in the influent feed. But they tend to be high rate systems. Uh, they're not good at dealing with solids in almost any of these cases. UASVs are nice because you can hold granules for essentially an indefinite amount of time. And you can change your recirculation rates in your UASB so you can hold the liquids for as long as you need to, tr uh, to treat the COD. Whereas your granules are just going to sit in the system and get bigger and bigger and continue to work better and better. And also the fact that the community and a granule is so close together can actually make some of these anaerobic processes more efficient in general. But any upflow reactor that's relying on granules or media attachment will not like to have solids entering the system. Uh, solids will typically, I mean, some dense solids are okay, like iron oxide or things that granules can begin to grow around, but less dense things like, I don't know, primary sludge is a good example, or like fats, that kind of thing. It's actually going to reduce the density of the granules. Paper material would be awful too. And then you start to lose your granules, which take months and months and months to grow. So it can become a real disaster. So stick with high, uh, high soluble COD, low solids for that. Type I want to add that we see UA, UASBs like in breweries or a pop manufacturer or someone who processes potatoes, something like that. But like, like Dan said, when the peels of the potatoes or some of the potato fibers get in there, that's a problem. 
They're really good for those places with high sugar, and we use a lot of our, uh, some of our micronutrients with them because they'll be deficient, but Chris will comment on it later. So here's just a brief rundown of anaerobic environments. The main things to keep in mind are you have a methanogenic, you have two methanogenic groups, the mesophilic or thermophilic communities. Most of the reactors we work with are mesophilic. Technically, the best temperature for mesophilic bacteria is 97 to 98 degrees Fahrenheit. You can operate outside that range, but that is where we'll function the best. I've seen quite a few systems lately operating close to like 102 to 104 Fahrenheit, which might help with hydrolysis in some difficult to degrade substrates cases. But for the methanogens specifically, it starts to become a bit of an hindrance, kind of like if you have a fever, you're going to start to make the pathogens in your system not operating as well. It's kind of like your methanogens are going to start to fail to work as you get to these higher temperatures. However, if you increase the temperature enough, you have other methanogens which can fill in these roles for producing methane in the thermophilic range. Typically, that's around 130 Fahrenheit, but there's a diverse range there. Thermophilic digesters, we mostly are seeing for people who are trying to produce class A sludge. It's really good for inactivating pathogens. pH is another thing I've been interested lately with the fact I've been seeing a lot of digesters with pH like 7.5 which is pushing the high end of our uh, ideal digester pH range. Uh, as you get closer to pH 7, you have a larger variety of methanogens that are able to function. And as you get further from pH 7, less and less operate until you get around pH 6.2 or something, you're starting to lose pretty much all of your methanogens. Or if you get above pH 7.5, you're starting to lose a substantial amount of methanogen function as well. We've seen uh, digesters erring on the higher end, and I think they're just trying to play on the safe side. So if they have a pH drop, um, you're not, you have a little further to go before it's a real problem, but you are hindering your diversity in methanogens if you operate in these higher pH values for longer periods of time, uh, which can be okay, but it might make you more susceptible to upsets in some cases. But once you get above pH 7.5, you start to have major issues with conversion of ammonium NH4+, which is non-toxic to digesters for the most part. I mean, if you have like 1,000, 2,000 ppm, it can start to be inhibitory. But in most cases, it's not a big deal. Whereas ammonia, which is produced from ammonium at higher pH values, that's NH3, it becomes toxic at like 50 ppm to methanogens. It's a lot more inhibitory. You can have a lot of upsets occur that way. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Uh, next thing is nutrient requirements. We have a fairly broad COD to N to P ratio, depending on what type of substrate you're working with. Some substrates, like simple sugars, tend to not need a lot of nitrogen or phosphorus to degrade because it's so easy to access the substrates. Nitrogen and phosphorus tend to be more important for more complex substrates, which requires more enzyme production to be able to access more complex nutrients. So you have a wide range, potentially, depending on the type of feed substrate you're working with. We also have our other macronutrients, sulfur and iron. Typically high sulfur means you need more iron. Sulfur precipitates out with iron, and you have, if you have excess sulfur, you tend to select for more hydrogen sulfide forming organisms or sulfur reducing bacteria. So, and you'll be deficient on iron, which can hinder your anaerobic bacteria otherwise. So, if you have high sulfur, you're going to want to supplement additional iron in most cases, and you almost can't add enough. It's kind of like you're going to want to precipitate a large portion of that sulfur. And then we're going to talk a little bit later about how we uh, work to improve the biological community to reduce sulfur release. And we'll talk a little about that later. I also want to add here that um, when you get an upset, your acid formers are going to recover quickly. Your methane formers, a full recovery often takes as much as six months. And one other note here relating to, we have our micronutrients listed as well. Um, a lot of systems I've seen operate micronutrient efficient for years. And this is always really interesting because if you think of something as being mandatory to a digester operation, especially like cobalt or nickel, but selenium and molybdenum are some other micronutrients which are considered to be pretty important. Um, but if your digester is operating fine for years without these, this is kind of, it indicates that some of these nutrients may be essential in some cases and not other cases. 
But the other thing to keep in mind is having deficiencies in micronutrients may not immediately inhibit your digester function, but it might limit its ability to recover from upsets as well. That's something to always keep in mind. The more you're accounting for different factors, like having proper temperature, proper nutrient balance, proper pH values, you're increasing your digester stability by allowing as many different bacterial uh, systems to function at the same time. So for our feedstock of concern, here's a list of a few of our feedstocks. Uh, typically, we're going to be considering really high solids feedstock, like waste activated sludge, primary sludge, manure, that kind of thing. A lot of these have a lot of challenges with hydrolysis. Uh, hydrolysis, like I said, is facilitated by exoenzymes produced by bacteria. But this is the point where a lot of our biocatalyst products, which Chris will be talking about later, are going to address is hydrolyzing these complex substrates so that we can produce simpler substrates, which are easier for the bacterial population to use up because hydrolysis can be very limiting, particularly in these high solids waste streams. Uh, when you start to get to lower solids, then it's more a case of having the proper micronutrients present. So you'll see you add micronutrients because your stream is not as diverse. You don't have as many nutrients present quickly. Hydrolysis is not going to be limiting if you don't have any solids in the system because hydrolysis is the breakdown of solids into soluble matter. So main considerations with feedstock. Um, we get a lot of calls about people attempting to take in new digester feedstock and then encountering an upset or they're worried about taking a new feedstock, that kind of thing, or they're trying to start up an entirely new system and they want to know if it is feasible to, based on the seed sludge they have available and the feed they have available. And in many of these cases, you can get away with quite a bit in startup as long as you do the proper analysis to know that you have the nutrients you need available and supplement what you don't have. As well as that, you're gonna want your seed sludge to be as diverse as possible and collected ideally from a similar site so you can have good digestion take place and you don't need the community to undergo too large a shift in order to get started. The other thing is simply the more seed sludge you have, really the better. Methanogens are slow growing, so if you start them out at a much higher concentration, it'll take a lot less time to develop what you need to treat the feedstock. Um, don't try to make any quick changes. If you're starting up a digester or receiving a new feedstock, be sure to ramp up slowly so that you're not going to overwhelm your system because once you see pH drops, you, your methanogens are basically going to stop. All your other organisms will keep running and you'll end up needing to pour in thousands and thousands of pounds of some sort of base in order to bring the pH back up. And it's very labor intensive, it's stressful. It's hard to get past that sort of thing. You don't want your digester to crash right after you make a change. It can also be valuable to perform studies on your samples you're going to be working with. So you can take your inoculum, your sludge from your digester, blend it with your new feedstock you're planning on receiving, and do a study like a biomethane potential test or something along those lines. So you can see if that feedstock is going to work well with your methanogenic community. And if it is, you can generally get away with taking it. If it's not, you might have to make some modifications to the feedstock or regulate how much you're willing to accept to prevent an upset. Uh, most of the cases when people get into trouble, it's either through not doing a lot of background research on the new feedstock they're going to take or having some inhibitory conditions in their digester already, which are limiting the ability of the bacteria to be diverse and efficient. So you're going to want to check out nutrients in your digester, nutrients in the feed, and potentially perform even degradability studies, like I mentioned, to be able to understand if a change in your system is going to mess up your system or if the system will respond well to it. So now that I've covered that, we're going to go through a few lab studies. Uh, most of these are run as some form of a BMP test, which is a biomethane potential study. In our case, we're generally going to be using inoculum from the sites that are providing us the feed substrate. I feel like that is the most representative for a single client. There's a lot of different ways BMP tests could be run, and ours is a little bit. Uh, it's not necessarily a standard test. We modify it to make sense based on what we're trying to do which is usually study if a biocatalyst or a micronutrient supplementation would be beneficial for a specific system. Um, we have a couple of questions here. I'll just take a moment to answer before we get on to our lab studies. 
One is how will pH affect gas production? I kind of answered that before, but like, basically you get the best quality biogas production at neutral pHs, pH seven. As you get further away, you might still get good gas production if you have enough methanogens acclimated to that pH for the system to operate well. But if you don't, you're gonna to start to see a drop off in methanogenesis. Our next one is what was the bench test mentioned for the feedstock seed mixture to view effects on new stock in the digester? There's a couple ways to do this, but generally speaking, there are methane potential tests where you take anaerobic uh, uh, anaerobic inoculum, which is your bacterial sample, and blend it with the feedstock, and then you're collecting the gas being produced through the degradation and seeing how the gas production is influenced by a feedstock versus what you've already been feeding the digester or versus some standard which is known to be able to anaerobically digest well. So you can see, is this new feedstock relatively easy or difficult to degrade? Um, but there's a lot of variants on this. Usually I've seen some cases that are, you know, efficient, but very low tech. Like you take a soda bottle, you drill a hole in the top and run a gas tube out of it, and you start to collect gas in a gas bag. And like, that's not an ideal test because it's not gonna be temperature controlled, but it can still give you some idea of how a feedstock is producing biogas. It's better than doing nothing. Alternatively, there's very formal studies. I was at, um, Marquette doing an anaerobic course the last week. And they have a lot of different standard inoculums they work with, and they're feeding a wide range of substrate, and they'll do things like they'll look for the inhibitory concentration of new substrates, or they'll just look at methane potential using a stock bacterial sample, or they can look at how healthy a bacterial sample is by giving it a really easy to degrade feedstock. There's a lot of a lot of range of testing available, basically. Let me add, I mean, that's a great question, but we have about three or four ways currently of running that test, depending on what's representative of what the customer wants to see and what they're doing. So the first study we're gonna look at, um, I just wanted to make a quick comment. I didn't mention this before, but Kevin mentioned we have a room dedicated for anaerobic studies we're working on. I've been spending a lot of time acquiring equipment and working on building lab reactors and things like that so we can do as many realistic digester studies as we can. Um, over the past years, this is kind of a new development since 2022 because previously we had to commission out a lot of our testing, but now we're getting a lot more data being produced because we're doing it all in-house or a lot of it in-house. And that allows us to rapidly accelerate our research and development so we can start better understanding systems and more applications and that kind of thing. But right now, we're going to be focusing on some BMP studies using a client uh, sample of bacteria and their feedstock from one site. Uh, this first one is looking at Anazine G. Uh, we've worked on this in the past with a couple partner studies. We worked with the University of Oshkosh and the University of Stevens Point to get a sense for how Anazine G affected fatty acid production. But in this case, we were looking at a mixed test on methane. Uh, in a dairy sample, which was enriched by additional heavy whipping cream. We have two studies we're going to be talking about here. The first one was a simple comparing the addition of anazine G to no anazine G with cream added to our feed substrate at a rate of 2%. And in these cases, we saw at the beginning of the test, it's possible that the control was actually a little faster. Um, it's not far apart. They're really pretty similar. It's just, it's possible there was more fatty acids available. So it took a moment for the reactors to kind of figure out what to do with them. But after just a couple of days, we saw the Anazine G uh, reactors had more methane production taking place compared to our control. And at the end of the test, we noticed an 18.4% increase in biogas production overall suggesting that Amazon G was helpful in producing more biogas in a mixed anaerobic test, uh, which was nice because we didn't have that data up to this time. This is a case where you have enough nutrients, you have a relatively healthy sludge, we were able to increase it by, and this would be a hydrolysis limited system. I want to answer Bernard's question. He asked a question, any problem with the flocculants, coagulants? Um, generally like alum, aluminum chlorohydrate, uh, polymers, they don't pose a problem for us. What poses a problem is if the flocculants, coagulants uh, are flocking up a, um, a filament bacteria, like microthrix. Mm -hmm. 
then you're covering up the problem and then the problem and then the, the digester starts to foam. So that's generally where we see the problem. Yeah, and like I mentioned before, uh, most of the time when you see filaments in a digester, we're talking about a digester that's being fed waste activated sludge specifically. So anyway, the next study I wanted to see, I was trying to intentionally crash our reactors by supplementing very high amounts of cream to the waste feed. Keep in mind, this was already a relatively high strength waste stream to begin with, but we added an additional 6% cream to it. And at that point, we were starting to see our reactors were failing to perform optimally with the addition of Anazide G. But however, this is one thing we're going to be exploring more later, where we actually were able to supplement. In this case, we used Accelerator 7 as a nutritional supplement. And what we observed was actually we saw improved methane production with the addition of Accelerator 7 and Anazine G versus our control by a fairly substantial margin. We're talking about 8.9% uh, change in methane um, at 6% cream versus our original 0% uh, control, as opposed to seeing a 45% increase. So it made a substantial difference there. At our lower dose rates, we saw basically across the board improvements with Anazine G, and it was unclear whether Accelerator 7 made a big difference or not. So this is the type of thing where we're looking at very extreme cases to see if we can improve the ability of a digester to accept more and more, in this case, heavy whipping cream, but any high fat substrate would be pretty representative. Uh, the next study we looked at was a BMP study on Quixon D, Amazon P, and micronutrients. Uh, this is a partner study we're working on actually right now with the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. And the nice thing about this is once we're done with our BMP study, they'll be able to do it in a full-scale digester with the additives we believe fit best in this case. And then we're going to do it with additives and without additives. So we'll run about three months with the addition of a new uh, whatever additive we end up deciding to use. And then we'll take them away, see if the biogas production drops off, and then start it up again. And we'll also be looking at it in two different seasons, winter and summer because digesters tend to behave a little different based on uh, the feed temperature entering the digester as well. So here's how this has gone so far. Um, you can see on the left, we were looking specifically at metals, and then on the right, we're looking at Amazon P and Quickside D. And interestingly, in this case, the addition of metals by itself, despite us taking a measurement showing low metals, didn't make that big a difference. So we knew the metals were deficient, but in this case, based on our results on the right with the enzymes, hydrolysis was much more limiting than the metal concentration, which is kind of what I was talking about before. This is a really high solids feed substrate. Hydrolysis tends to be limiting. However, uh, what we saw in the next slide is when we supplemented metals, we actually did see improvements in biogas yield with the addition of the enzyme. So this is a case where we needed to help the main rate limiting step hydrolysis, and then we were able to see improvements in biogas generation with the addition of metals. Like on the left, we were seeing a 7.9 or a 7.29% increase with Amazon P with our uh, standard selected metal addition. And on the right, we saw a general improvement, both with a complete metal supplement and then our standard metal addition as well. We were seeing pretty similar results. Let me add, uh, the Amazon P is a product that degrades proteins. And in meat packing plants, in cheese plants, and in uh, manure, we have seen an inability for the naturally occurring bacteria to produce protease. So Amazon P is a protease. It degrades the stable proteins into amino acids, which the bacteria can use. Yeah, and an additional note here, the quickzyme, D product is a product we tip, we're studying to get a better understanding of how it behaves in anaerobic systems. So it's not, we're probably going to at some point be adding something like it to our enzyme lineup, but it's focusing on breaking down of fats and cellulose material specifically. So in this case, we're seeing that the degradation of proteins and the degradation of fats and cellulose actually had pretty similar impacts overall in this case to methane production. Uh, it's possible a combination of the two would be even better in a lot of these cases. So we're going to potentially be working with that at the Oshkosh site. All right, the next thing is we're starting to measure methane concentration and biogas quality in our tests as well. Previously, we've just been measuring off methane produced. 
Um, but here we saw with no supplements, we were only getting 51% methane production. And with our supplements, either metals or anazine, we were able to get that up to about 60%, which is starting to get into the healthy range for methane production concentration. Typically, you're going to want to see 60 to 70, sometimes a little bit higher than 70%. Uh, we might see a bigger difference if we were able to run this test for a larger period of time. Uh, we are able to measure hydrogen sulfides as well, but in this case, we just didn't have very much sulfides present, so I was reading off close to zero in all of the cases. Uh, the final study I'm going to talk about today is a micronutrient supplement. Uh, this was run by Digester Doctor Labs, who we work with. They do a lot of BMP testing, that sort of thing for clients. Definitely can reach out to them if you want to run a BMP style study on your sample. Um, but anyway, uh, in this case, we're doing dairy manure, and we also do some slaughterhouse waste in some of the tests they're running. We worked with them on this. We provided the biogas one, and they collected a bunch of data and shared it with us. So in the case on the left, we were looking at a case that was mostly micronutrient limited because we can see the addition of anazine P and quicksine D, which is what they added in that case, made a relatively minor impact in total biogas concentrate uh, production versus the control compared to just adding biogas one in this case. So we did see some benefits from improving hydrolysis, but this would be a case where the micronutrients were more rate limiting. So the supplementation of micronutrients made the bigger difference. The study on the right, however, the slaughterhouse wastewater this was kind of interesting because we saw only a small bump in methane production, kind of similar to our study with the Oshkosh sample with the addition of biogas one. But again, we saw a much larger bump in methane production with the addition of biogas one, quicksand D, and anazine G. So you can see these cases, it's very, it varies from system to system. What are, uh, whatever you measure in your system in terms of micronutrients, uh, it's possible they are rate limiting. It is possible something else in your digester is actually the main rate limiter in the digestion process. But addressing both points tends to make a bigger difference than addressing either point individually. I want to answer the question, do we, do we attempt to mimic uh, specific customer conditions? Yes. That's why it's, we have so <laughs> many ways of doing it. If they're, if they're mixed, if they're not mixed, what's the sludge retention time? What's the, what's the temperature? What's the loading? How does the loading change? So yeah, we go to great lengths to mimic what's going on. And can I use an enzyme if the pH is 6.2? Yes, the enzyme will work very well at 6.2. So now that I've finished up talking about my lab studies, we get on to Chris's section of the presentation where you can talk more about the product specifically. Yeah, if you reference the handouts, I'll be covering pretty much everything that we have set there. So you can kind of look at those as we walk through it. Um, I'll give a brief description of, of some of the, the products and innovations that the lab here has come up with uh, for anaerobic and anaerobic processes. And these guys will help kind of explain in more depth what they understand the product does, et cetera, being as they're the ones that essentially designed it. That being said, Aquafix CS yes, is uh, located here in Madison, Wisconsin at the UW Research Park. We have technical service reps, as you see on the screen, that cover the entire country, and even uh, we do international work too. All essentially are here to help anytime you need to have any questions or concerns. Uh, we are a collaborative lab. Feel free to reach out, ask any questions you want. So we'll start off with Amazon G. Um, you guys saw that Dan referenced this earlier in a couple of his studies. Uh, it's a very uh, good enzyme that breaks down grease, breaks down fat caps on lagoons. It also improves volatile acids alkalinity ratio, avoids foaming, and improves overall gas and gas production. Kevin was mentioning that if you have fats, oils, and greases, this is a product that you're going to want to maximize your gas production. Anaerobic digesters have a difficult time degrading grease and then long chain fatty acids. Long chain fatty acid toxicity is a real thing. And so if you can speed the breakdown of that, you're gonna improve the methane. I wanted to say we had a we had a site that was getting a lot of grease, they were getting a lot of problems, they were accepting a lot of grease, but it made them a lot of money. And when we took and we add the Adazine G to it, we improved the conversion, it improved the stability of their digester and uh, they produced more gas. Yeah, and grease is a good example of a substrate that's pretty difficult to hydrolyze in an anaerobic digester. And then once you have the long chain fatty acids produced, it's also difficult to convert those to short-chain fatty acids. Both of those things tend to 
make a big impact in the rate of methane production. And there's a lot of studies that talk about the in inhibitory effects of grease or long chain fatty acids. In layman's term, what I think is the what I think happens is the grease just covers the bacteria so they can't respirate as well. Um, that being said, uh, do you guys find this being more of an issue in breakdown in anaerobic processes or aerobic processes? So anaerobic digesters are pretty well suited for the degradation of grease in general. They just need to have enough time. And what we see in some industries is they're continually taking Feeding. more and more grease in, and you hit a point where you just can't keep up with it both from the methanogenics end of the system where you're producing a lot of fatty acids and the hydro, uh, hydrolysis portion where you're trying to break them down. So I'm glad you talked about that because one thing that's key to Anazyme G and next Anazyme P, using these products appropriately will allow for in most cases you to load a little more. Um, again, that's variant on, on making sure you do it appropriately, but that's one of the best uh, parts about these products. Moving on to Amazon P, similar to Amazon G, but it focuses more on the proteins, et cetera, in terms of uh, breaking down proteins in highly loaded protein environments, cheese, uh, dairies, those types of processes. Um, again, allows for more loading um, so they don't get overwhelmed and reduces volatile solids and overall solids in the process. And if you ever want to see data, data on any of our products, we have the data on all of them. We produce all the data, we do all the studies, and then we do it individually for the customer. Well, I've seen the NFIB work really well on a number of manure studies, which was an interesting find. Next, uh, one of our most well-rounded and most popular products in anaerobic processes is our Defoam 3000. Defoam 3000 is a well-rounded deformer, uh, plant-based essential oils, uh, creates a monomolecular film, breaks surface tension. Uh, I was chatting with Kevin about it the other day. He says it's extremely stable in anaerobic uh, processes. That's why it works so well. Um, again, noting that it is one of our most popular products because foaming can cause such an issue in anaerobic digesters and it can become a very big problem, not only environmentally and around the, around the digester itself, but obviously we talked about this. It, it does affect gas production. Yeah, the, it'll definitely interfere with your ability to collect the biogas. And just another note on Defoam 3000, like it we recommend this a lot in cases with foaming, but it's not going to necessarily fix underlying issues surrounding performance. So if your digester is foaming up all the time, you're going to want to take a deeper look into exactly what is causing the foaming. Exactly. Generally, foam is a, a, a cause of some kind of issue underlying. Uh, at the end here, we're going to discuss some other testing that we do and kind of the keys and the importance of, of doing those tests and it kind of works backwards to uh, finding those out. But eFoam is a good solution if you're dealing with any kind of foaming event that you're having trouble controlling. Yeah, we have a question, uh, which is, will Amazon products work better or worse in thermophilic digesters? Technically speaking, they will work better at what they're trying to do in the thermophilic digester if you have problems with hydrolysis. What I will, because the the enzymes contained in these products will just work faster at higher temperature values up to about 60 degrees Celsius, which is substantially above what you'd see in a thermophilic digester. That being said, thermophilic digesters, first of all, their, their changes can happen very quickly in these systems, but they tend to be pretty good at things like hydrolysis anyway. Those processes tend to happen faster at warmer temperatures. So in some cases, you might see less of an impact just by results of the system doing a better job than it first was. Anaerobic food supplement. This is a well-balanced food source for uh, methane formers. It forms and builds biomass very quickly. Essentially, it's great for startups. It's great for any instances where you have any kind of uh, toxicity coming in. Or one of the big issues in the industry is variable loading. Consistency is key, as Dan said earlier. Uh, making sure everything is, is stable and running uh, consistent is the key to methane. And uh, this can help us uh, really well with that and stabilizing the feed. It works really well on the UASBs too to form granulation. If you're starting up a USAB, UASB, this is a really good product. Yeah, it's, it's really intended to be a targeted food specifically for the methanogens, which, as we mentioned, is the slowest growing organism. So. In most of these cases to speed that up. My flame is flickering yellow. What does that mean? 
That's a really good question. I'll let Dan elaborate. There's a lot of explanations for why your digester uh, torch could be flickering yellow. And also, there's a question of does it really matter to you or not? But the simple explanation is if you have a lower concentration of methane, the flame will tend to look more orange. Uh, sulfides might be making it look a little bit more yellow in some cases, but generally speaking, it just means you have more carbon dioxide in the biogas being produced. And that will matter in cases where your digester otherwise has an upset taking place. So you should be monitoring your system meticulously for things like volatile acid and alkalinity levels to see if the digester is having an upset in general. And if you're collecting and using the biogas, yellow the yellow flame is going to be suggesting your biogas is going to need more work to be usable. But if you're not using your methane and your digester is not being upset to begin with, it could just be a result of where you are in your digester feeding cycle and not that big a deal. So uh, moving on from the anaerobic food supplement, Boost and Locks is our pH and alkalinity product. It's a dry product um, to improve, as it says, buffering capacity, if you see on your, your handout there. Um, it's safe, easier to use. It's a superior blend of bicarbonates and carbonates. Uh, stabilize alkalinity uh, a lot better than any individually. Uh, and stabilize pH. It's best if used uh, above pH of 6, as it says. Um, again, I state it's better than caustic, safer, and more soluble than lime. We use uh... A little bit of magnesium hydro equal amounts of magnesium hydroxide, hydrated lime, soda ash, and sodium bicarbonate. And the combination provides greater buffering capacity and greater stability of pH. Yeah, when we talk about buffering capacity, uh, we there's an issue that pops up a lot. When we're talking about alkalinity in an anaerobic digester, we're mostly interested in pH stability not the amount of hydroxides we're talking about adding into the system. Now, if you add hydroxides to a system, you're not going to be producing much resistance to pH drops or pH increases, and your pH can just kind of go all over the place, which is why Boost and Lock contains quite a bit of carbonates and bicarbonates, which can buffer the pH to keep it closer to 7 and make it less susceptible to change at that point. All right, next to go along the lines with uh, Boost and Lock. Below pH of 6, we recommend the magnesium hydroxide. One thing, again, that one big key to this, it's very, very safe to use. There's no sodium in solids, and usually it won't put the pH above 8 at all. Like it will stabilize there, so you can use as much as you need to get it above 6, then utilize the boost and lock because it's going to be such a better uh, form of alkalinity, and that would be um, keep it stable at that point. But again, coming back to the mag, it's, it's so much easier to use in terms of safety that Kevin was even noting the other day to me uh, than some of the other uh, available products out there. Well, sodium hydroxide is really common. Of course, caustic is yeah, uh, very dangerous. And if you use it any too much, you're going to wildly swing that pH and kill a lot of bacteria. Yeah, it pushes it way up, right? Yeah, you can push it right up to 10 without any issue. Uh, Biogas one, uh, Dan utilized on his last study. Um, it's a micronutrient, uh, including iron, cobalt, nickel, and several other um, uh, bioavailable micronutrients. The key, not only to stabilizing, but obviously supplementing when a plant needs supplementation to uh, maximize not only performance, but obviously the end of the day, methane and gas production, correct? Yep, right. and these are all, like I said, bioavailable, meaning the bacteria are mm -hmm. going to transport them into their cell and they can use them. Whereas if you took a dry, cobalt or something. First of all, you don't want to be messing with dry cobalt. And second of all, um, um, you, you can throw it in there, but it's not going to be soluble. The bacteria aren't going to be able to get at it. That leads us in more to maybe what you'll chat a little bit about. But um, over the last year or so, Aquafix has gotten uh, expanded their uh, metals testing, anaerobic screening. Um, as it says here, it looks at all the metals, significant, uh, efficient anaerobic digestion, some of what I'll show you in the next slide. Um, the sample analyzes for 19, 19 micronutrients compared to soluble and insoluble uh, fractions of metals. Uh, from there, we give you comprehensive feedback on how to improve your process, uh, not only what metals to add, but uh, gradually uh, biogas uh, is getting a few other um, formulations that we're going to be able to recommend more specifically from what we're able to find on your anaerobic chemistry screen. So there is, in the handouts tab, we also added an anaerobic screening report, one thing to comment on. But the other thing to consider is when we're looking at metals concentrations, 
Uh, we typically focus the most on cobalt, nickel, selenium, molybdenum, and iron, uh, which tend to be the biggest ones for your methanogens present. A lot of the other metals are more for your acetogenic type communities, which have a lot more flexibility in what they can use for their uh, enzyme cofactors and that kind of thing. One thing we've noted a lot is metal screening is good to give you some idea of what metals are present and not present. If you have a lot of a metal present, it probably won't be any benefit to supplement it, even if it's, and, but, and generally, if you have a metal that's completely absent, you will see benefits. Even though we're already trying our, uh, we have a method where we're screening out, we're comparing soluble and insoluble metals side by side so we can get some sense of the bioavailability of the metals present in the system. But even with that, you're never 100% certain as to what forms the metals are taking. So there's a lot of cases where we'll be, you'll do the screening and it'll be like, it might be beneficial to add this metal or might not. And then at that point, the best case is just try and add a little bit, see if it makes a difference, maybe ramp it up a little bit after that. But this is really good to give you some idea of what you're going to need in your digester for optimal function. And we have a lot of background data on this. In the world of trace metals, a little is good, a lot is toxic. So you want to add just what you need, not any two more. And we, don't, we just don't look at the metals, but we look at the total solids, volatile solids, et cetera, because we want to get a view of the whole picture of the digester. So we have a question here, which is actually perfect. How often should I do a metals analysis? Now, Dan and I, before this, were discussing uh, not only that, but maybe bringing up the importance of doing an initial one, even when it's a healthy, uh, healthy or presumed to be healthy, correct? Mm -hmm. um, but also just the importance overall of knowing, you know, uh, knowing what you're about. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess um, how often, it's nice to have some metals data from when your plant is functioning well. It's nice to do metals analysis when you're taking in a new feed substrate or if a change is being made to your feedstock so you can understand if your system may start to experience a metal deficiency or overabundance for that matter. Um, so generally, I'd say it's good to do at least one or two when everything's functioning well and then when you're about to make a change or shortly after you make a change, it's also really helpful to do metals analysis. We get a lot of analysis kits from a plant that has already been upset. And in many of these cases, it's like, oh, my plant's been running great for five or six years. I don't know what happened here, but we wanted to do a metal screening to get some idea if that's relevant. And it likely is a little bit relevant, but if your plant has functioned for five years, totally great with no selenium, in a lot of the cases, it's hard to be like, eh, selenium is definitely the problem in that case. Usually there is something else going on if your plant normally functions well. So you want to have that in mind. What metals levels do you have when your plant is functioning well? Because some of them might look like they are low and your plant might still be fine. Sorry. All right. Now we'll get a chance, obviously, to hear move on with questions. Could you scroll up a little bit of this one right there? So this is an interesting one. What is the max TDS PPM for an anaerobic reactor? Uh, that depends quite a bit. You could be talking about what your feed substrate you're working with is. You could be talking about what type of digester you are, are dealing with. And what is making up the TDS? We talk a lot about metals concentrations. There's a number of cases where you could have high TDS because you have quite a bit of a dissolved metal in the system. And that might be inhibiting the digester but you could have TDS from something pretty inert and harmless and it wouldn't necessarily make any difference. So unfortunately, there's not like one number I can give you exactly for that answer, but there's a number of different things to look for. Like what is making up the TDS specifically is a good one. Now, if you have more questions on that or any of these questions, feel free to just email us, reach out to us afterwards. We can talk with you more specifically about the question and, and probably look into it more and hopefully find you an answer. Um, here's one that's actually pretty uh, important one that you probably run into a lot. What metals are the most commonly deficient in the newer digesters? Hmm. I've seen a number of cases where we get a cobalt and nickel deficiency. That seems to be the most common. Um, beyond that, molybdenum occasionally is low. Um, selenium, I'm still on the fence on whether it's that important in the newer digestion or not. But it seems like it is in some cases, and sometimes its levels are low. But I'd say mostly cobalt and nickel. 
here we have from uh, from Melissa. Uh, what can you do if you have accumulated VFAs and you already have adjusted the pH, the COV, but the problem persists? This would be a case where I would do a hard look in everything that has changed since the VFAs have begun to increase. Is there anything that could be changed? Could there be something mechanically going wrong in your digester? Are, are any of the feed substrates you're taking on different than normal? Beyond that, you can start look at, to look at things like metal concentrations, and that might help you understand ways to help your digester improve more quickly, but it's not necessarily the cause of the upset, though I guess it could be. But yeah, usually you'd be talking about maybe you took something into your system that's inhibitory, or maybe your feed substrate has just changed and your bacterial population is not able to deal with it well. Yeah, I, I always like to take a look at the feedstocks and what's changed, and then I like to look at the whole picture, not not just the the metals, but the you know all of the other components and stuff like that, and, and the the process, and see see what may have changed in that process. Like like I said earlier, we have a partnership with UW Oshkosh, and that's where we're um, digging deep into this thing, not just uh, in our lab, but then on site in 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 their uh, anaerobic digester. Uh, some of the common questions we get, and I think we answered a lot of them, is uh, what do you guys do to degrade cellulose? And that really depends, and we're really studying that really carefully now. It depends on the whole digester and what, what's going into that, that thing. So we're, we're working on that now. We have this product for aerobic processes, and we're working to fine-tune that and see if we can improve that. That was the quick sign D. Yep, that was the quick sign D. And the other, uh, the other common question is, uh, I think we tackled it. Is I'm getting enough gas. It seemed to be doing well. Why would I? Why would I do anything, right? And uh, it's always important to understand your system when it's running really well, because it won't run. It won't run really well forever, and something will happen. And then when you understand it when it's running well, then it's easier to have a baseline for changes moving forward. One question here from Delia. Hopefully, I pronounce that correctly. What about the ratio of PS to S? Hmm. You know, I'm not sure exactly what's the most common off the top of my head, though to me, I think somewhere between 50-50 and 70-30, um, one way or another, is workable. Um, typically, if you have too much waste-activated sludge, you might start to see some issues with foaming and things like that. So you gotta be a little bit careful, especially if you have filaments growing in the waste activated sludge. The primary sludge I haven't seen cause too many problems in a municipal process. Usually you can kind of add as much of it as you want. The digester will be okay, as long as there isn't some toxin present or something really weird going on in your system, like a dairy manufacturer dumped 20,000 gallons of cream that got screened out or something. Yeah, inert solids can also accumulate if you don't have good grit removal and stuff like that at the beginning. We ran into that once when we just hadn't cleaned it out in so long that it was creating yeah. some issues. Yeah. Yeah. I always like to say you guys have to control what, what goes out. you got to limit your sludge production and maximize your gas production and your methane. But you sometimes you have little controls to what comes in. And the farmer is studying you know, your Oshkosh. One summer it did great. The next summer it did, it did poorly. And it turns out it had to do with a fertilizer or they were putting uh, gypsum, I think with gypsum or some kind of sulfur-based material on their on their um, field. And then that mm -hmm. came into the process and also you get high sulfites and other upsets. Um, but but we like to dig deep on the behalf of our customer and really understand what is causing the problem, what's causing it. Yeah, out of curiosity, we haven't posted a poll, so let's let's see. Uh, what type of digester does everybody have that we're working with? Generally, most of our studies and most of your testing is done with you know, a general complete mix, correct? Without yeah. Setting up in the lab. Yeah, complete mix is the easiest to work with in a lot of cases because, you know, you're, you've got, it's easy to get a representative sample. That's been a big problem with studying lagoons is it's hard to get somebody to collect samples from like 10 different spots in the lagoon so we have a representative sludge sample. Um, so that's a good question to lead into. Lagoons and mechanical plants, uh, the digesters. So the enzymes, they work very similarly in both, correct? Yeah. Yeah. The, the enzymes are going to work pretty much the same. Um, 
I would say lagoons in general have more problems with hydrolysis because there's less water movement, which means in some cases the enzymes will actually work better in those things. Um, but yeah, so we're seeing the majority is complete mixed with a decent amount of lagoons in there, less UASBs and more other. Yeah, that's that seems pretty typical. And as far as how many people are making use of their biogas, do we uh, post that second poll just for checking on that? What do you do with the biogas? Oh, this is a really diverse answer set. Yeah, does anybody want to comment on what their other is for what they do with their biogas? It'd be interesting to learn about. They can it. You move to chat just so we can see. Uh, if, if people who selected other in biogas production want to comment in chat, it'd be interesting to see what you're doing with it. Uh, we have another question. Is there a maximum EN in the CN ratio? Sometimes they run about 40. That's a great question. Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. Is what, and I think it's, it's all over the board, isn't it, Dan? It's a yeah. wide range. It's very feedstock dependent. Um, typically, I won't see too many issues with having too much N other than if you have too much ammonia production and that starts to be inhibitory in the system, which if you're measuring your ammonia levels in your digester effluent, you can get a really good sense if you're having too much nitrogen in your system. We have a, uh, we have a, we have a lagoon process and there, there are lagoon gets a lot of grease in there. And every year, about the same time, their lagoon was getting really upset. Um, the one in Illinois, Dan, yeah. I don't know if the pH was dropping or what was going on, but it was getting really upset. And then we started working on their behalf and doing testing, and we found that it was nitrogen deficient. Um, and so they use our accelerator product, which is a blend of amino acids, and they've been using that now for three years. And, and add, continually adding that, they've had no upsets. So, but it, I don't remember what the seating in ratio was now. It was, it was upwards of a thousand. thousand. So yeah. It was it was over a thousand to seven. Yeah, I, I almost think it was like three thousand. Yeah. yeah, it was super low. Yeah. And they they did have some upsets. I would say having a nitrogen deficiency is not real common, but it's happened enough times, or at least people have been concerned about it enough times that we've been starting to do more testing where we've included something like I added Accelerator 7 into that uh, fat cells and grease testing I did, for example. Uh, thank you all for attending. Um, as I said earlier, our lab is your lab. If you have something difficult or just a challenge you want to talk, reach out to us and we'd, we'd, we'd love to discuss it. Um, study of anaerobic digestion is what we do. And if any of you are ever in Madison, look us up. We'll give you a tour. Thank you.